Church, the Kedongaburi Bean India, um, which is now also known as the St. Helens Centre on the island, following a, a refurbishment a few years ago uh, to make sure it was fairly weatherproof, which had become uh, not so much. Um, and we're using it really during this summer as a, a centre for the Marine Festival. And the reason why we're having the Marine Festival is because the Marine Reserve around London, now known as a Marine Protected Area, is 50 years old this year. So we're trying to make a little bit of a song and dance about that and highlight why it's London waters are special. Um, one of the activities we have going on uh, is a weekly talk given by an expert in their field, um, many of whom I happen to know personally, which has been uh, very nice, and I've had the, the luxury of being able to select people who I know are excellent speakers and uh, are very keen to, to sort of pass messages on. So I'm delighted to say that this week we have Michael Pitts with us, who I've known for quite a number of years now, who is one of the foremost wildlife cameramen in the country, if not further afield. He has travelled extensively, as we will find out, and he has produced programmes and shot programmes on television uh, for many different companies, the BBC and uh, Netflix and National Geographic and people like that. So I think you're really in for a treat this evening. Um, so uh, I'm going to invite Michael to come uh, sit down and we're going to just talk a little bit about actually how we met. Normally I would ex uh, ask the speaker perhaps a few questions as to how they got into their particular career. But this time, because he's actually going to cover that in his talk, um, we're going to uh, talk about how we met because I hope you might find that interesting. So can I introduce Michael Bits? <laughs> University 
employee at Cambridge University, a bird person, and he realised that not only were the birds of these islands not well known, but little was known about their breeding game. So that was really his main uh, reason for wanting to try to get to these islands. Um, there were British overseas territories as well, so we feel we, the country has some responsibility to look after them. Um, but in 1988, the one island, Henderson Island, and there are four islands in the Pit Cairn group, which is an uninhabited island, quite a large one, was uh, declared a World Heritage Site. And it was declared a World Heritage Site because it's known as a raised coral atoll, which is very rare. There's only uh, one other one in a similar condition, which is Aldabra in the Indian Ocean. But what's happened over geological time is that there originally were three atolls making up these islands. Then Pitcairn, which is the youngest island, suddenly decided to erupt from the seabed as a volcano. And the existing island of Pitcairn, which is about the same size as Lundy now, but you can imagine it's quite a bit higher, <laughs> as I said, holding my hands like this, it's very much a peak and then drop down. Um, Pitcairn eruption suddenly put a huge amount of magma on the tectonic plate in one particular point and it had this balance effect so that this other island of Henson just was lifted up out of the water. Now this didn't happen sort of overnight, it took uh, about 800,000 years to happen to get to its existing state but it's now 30 metres above sea level where once was this coral lagoon surrounded by small atolls. So we've now got an island that's made of solid coral rock and on the top of which you can still see fossilised coral and clam shells and things like that which have just been there for 800,000 years. It's now also covered with some fairly dense jungle on the top. Um, but very little was known about this island apart from this strange uplift effect about it and it's a bit about its geology. So um, this fairly major expedition was launched and it had scientists from all over the world going to this island, mostly to stay between three and four months. The whole expedition lasted 15 months and the leader from the Cambridge University was there for that whole 15 months as well. We were all camping. Um, so he, he put up that tent for quite some time. Um, then, uh, as I say, I was fortunate enough to go out there with a colleague who were undertaking a marine survey around the whole island. And um, that then allowed us to um, dive into some pretty remote aspects of the island. There wasn't any sort of coast guard to come and rescue us if anything happened. So we had to be very cautious uh, to be able to get all around this island. Um, and we were there for uh, three and a half months. It had taken us two weeks to get there from Tahiti. It's 2,000 miles from Tahiti, which is the largest international airport. You can actually now fly closer to the island, um, about a two to three days sail away. But where we were, we ended up with all our bags and luggage, about uh, five of us on this chartered yacht to then sail for two weeks to, pick, uh, to Henderson itself. Um, so we, we ended up there, um, <clears throat> and pretty much that was us. There was a small expedition yacht we had to our, our, our use. Um, but the BBC, in their wisdom, were at the planning uh, a programme about the spread of Polynesians throughout the South Pacific area. Um, and that's in a way where now Michael comes in. So I'm going to hand over to you to explain how you got involved with that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, many, many years ago now, in the um, winter of 1992, I'd um, flown down from uh, Hong Kong down to Tahiti and then from Tahiti down to Mangareva, and I joined the yacht and then I headed out down to Pitcairn, which take three or four days, it took us a week because of bad weather. We had to have days just to recover from that voyage and then from there we went from Pitcairn straight across to Henderson and that's where I met Robert was, I can't remember how many people on the island, about 11 of us was there in total at the time, over 12 people on the island. And um, yeah, it was, you know, it was one of those ocean going trips I'll never ever forget. I lived in the cockpit. We had uh, eight bunks on the uh, yacht for nine people. 
and there was a problem whilst we were nicking diesel lines, so every time you put your head down below, I didn't feel very well, so I just stayed in the cockpit for a week, got a suntan, got very wet, but there we are. But what I'm going to talk about this evening is um, a, bit, um, it's, it's a series of pictures I've put together for British Film Institute film students. I, I gave a series of lectures in the spring to a group of students in Hackney um, who were making two films. So they don't have my background, they, they weren't making natural history programmes, but the process of making the film be it natural history or a drama or a documentary, the basics stay the same. So putting together stories into sequences and joining those sequences together in a sort of a, a perfect <coughs> flourish or flow like or how you read a book. I'm going to actually sit back slightly because I know I'm more for the view of some people here. Can we have the lights off? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I'll speak this way because it's already been to pass the I haven't been to the bar so, so, um, so here we go. In the deep end, capturing drama and detail on the water. Um, my epiphany with the other water world happened through my parents. I was very lucky. My father was based in Germany, one of the small or sales. They took me to the Baltic on a holiday. This German man was on holiday as well, bearing in mind this was in the 50s. And he, I borrowed his Martin small ball, and that was it. I was hooked. I was not going to do anything else. I wanted to be a diver for the rest of my life. And I came through it through a circuitous route. Although I went into the military, I was never a military diver. Um, I was a sports diver, but during that time, I just did, spent all my all my money on houses, cameras, and I made a film. That film on a film festival it was an amateur film festival. One of the judges who I think sent the film to a company called Survival Anglia, Anglia Television. They then contacted me. I went up to London to have an informal meeting, and they gave me my first contract. So a lot of people will talk about the sort of complexities of dying and. Um, what you need to do if you're a rebreather diver, or you dive on a hooker, or you scuba, or try and mix. There's lots of ways you can dive to go and get images, and I've used all of those really. But one of the best ways of filming is with a master snorkel. It really is. This is in the Arabian Gulf. It was from a film I did, uh, which was the most like David Attenborough. But breath holding, um, you can get so much closer to your subject, you're not restricted. It's so much easier in warm water, of course, unlike cold water. Uh, here I am, this is last year, slightly different camera system. I'm working on a, a new series called Planet Dinosaur. Uh, I was the cameraman on um, Walking with Dinosaurs, Walking with these Sea Monsters. So they, in either the latter part of my career, let's be quite frank, people used to say to me, oh Michael, how do you get off? How do you start this business? They now say to me, when are you going to finish? <laughs> so, but I still get called out on these jobs because it's the understanding of what you're doing with CGI models um, and these sorts of setups with you know, filming back plates for well, basically it's like shooting for a feature film and we might get one or two shots a day because there's so many things going on with the cameras. Um, but this is in the Mediterranean. They saw you wearing, wearing a wetsuit, it's that warm. I got there, I looked at the scene and I thought, that's not wetsuit territory, that's dry suit. I put the dry suit on the first day, five weeks later I took it off. I just never, I just lived in that dry suit, it was so cold. It was an unbelievably cold um, summer last year in the event. But here I've got two cameras, I've got the 8K um, Red, which is in the lower housing. And there's a Z cam in a, in a with gates housing on top, which is a witness camera to give a 3D perspective for the CGI guys. And I'm monitoring on the back there. I'm, I'm on the but I'm not on the rebreather. Quite sure, filming in the sea glass. So this sequence here, um, let's just go back one now, sorry about that. This is these models, these are all models, what you're looking at from this one in the middle of back in the 80s, I remember that model, it's sort of two metres long, cost £4,000 to make, um, got um, various other shells and gastropods in there, all made. 
So I've created the scene, and what will happen in the scene is a large Mosasaurus will go over the top. So that's created by the CGI guys. So this is for real, and then we add in the Mosasaurus, and then the big predator that goes over the top of it. It's hunting a Mosasaurus. This will be out before Christmas, maybe this year. Um, so, yeah, I don't do just underwater, I shoot topside and um, all sorts of things. This is in the Soviet Far East, just sort of next to Siberia, right on the sea, looking for the Siberian tiger. Spent six weeks out there looking for it. Went out there in February, still lots of snow around, low level not. But in six weeks, not only did I film the tiger, I never even saw it. But I did hear it one night, that's as much as I got. But I filmed other things, I filmed bears, wild boar, uh, but I never saw the tiger. I saw lots of kills, I saw the tracks, they were very we were within. The closest we got was 12 hours. There we were 12 hours away from it, walking in snow. You just never catch up. So, and again in deserts, I worked on a series, you can see some of this in a minute. Uh, this is all about um, the desert of Dubai. So you find yourselves in lots of different locations. So you, it's about being able to work away from home, if you have a partner, working away from your partner, and having quite long trips, you know, sort of in quite difficult locations. But that's what I do, and that's what I love. Here, this is an expedition up to, this is on a series called Trials of Life, again, a David Attenborough series. This was after um, living planet and life on Earth. So this was the third series, Trials of Life, and I was very lucky to be asked to work on it. And one of the first jobs I went on was to the Galapagos. I'm starting on the Galapagos here, I don't know anyone on the Galapagos, but... So I had to go up to Alcena, which is an, uh, an active volcano. Um, there was three of us in the crew, we had two Sherpas, I'll call them Ecuadorian guys, that carried our water up to the volcano, the Caldera Rim. For about 3,000 feet. So we had to live up there for five days, and I had to film a piece of behavior with a finch. There's a particular finch that would de tick tortoises, and the finch would dance in front of the tortoise. It does a little dance in front of the tortoise. The tortoise would stand up, the finch jumps in, and it would start pulling out ticks out of the tortoise's neck. Now, what my friend um, Chris is doing, you can actually Tickle the tortoise from behind. <laughs> and this is like a bird hopping around the tortoise, and the tortoise will then stand on its legs and they're around um, waiting for a town. The only reason I got the secret, it was actually in the series, but the only reason I got it was on the last morning, I'd seen the bird do it, but by the time you set the camera up, because you're on a long lens, 300 mil lens or 600 mil lens, so by the time you find it, it suddenly pops off again. It lasts seconds. And then I was carrying away the campsite, we had very little food, but I had some old bread and I just threw the bread away. And I saw these finches hop down to eat the breadcrumbs. I suddenly thought, oh, I'll put the breadcrumbs in front of the tortoise. And I did, and one thing followed the other, and bang, it just stood up, and the finches jumped in and I got sequence. But all through luck. So, um, so it's also, I'm not a biologist, I'm not a marine biologist. I'm not an archaeologist, but when you're working with experts and being observant of behaviour is really key and not losing concentration and spending days in the highs. I was overlooking a female Komodo dragon. Now we knew this dragon had laid her eggs in this egg mound. Now this mound is not built by the dragon, it's built by two small birds over successive generations. And the mound can be anything from here to that wall over there. So you might have a 30 foot mound built by successive generations of what they call them in the mound ground. It's a type of mega bone. It's about the size of a chicken. It's got big feet and just scratches. And over, over the years and years, it builds up these mounds. Now, the female dragon, once she's mated, she will dig out the mound and she'll dig a series of tunnels. Now these tunnels can be anything from 6 feet to 12 feet in depth. They go right down at an angle. And how she does it, she'll just dig and dig and dig. The reason she digs these, these tunnels is because, you get an idea of the mound there, 
a guy, I've got a guy at Ranger there with me to make sure there's no problems. But this, after, this is a female, she's about six foot long. We call it pouring, this is called pouring nest. Now this area is very close to where the Swiss count, a Swiss count of 1986 went missing. And all they found was a heel of the shoe and a, a crunch camera. He died, he, a dragon hit him completely. But not female, it would a full male. They knew about this male, it was a very dangerous male. And most dragons, 95% of dragons will run away from you. But there are those few, and the dangerous ones are the ones that are habituated, who have become used to humans. Now she became very used to me, the poor and less female. But I would spend days here, or weeks here, waiting to get the behaviour, because when she lays her eggs, this is, that's the shot you just saw earlier, so I wanted to get the head coming into the hole, into the tunnel, and I bait her with her boiled egg. She loved boiled eggs, and I knew she loved them because I used to live on this boat, so I had four separate trips there on a little Indonesian fishing boat, because it was so hot on land. I'd go back three miles to this nest, so I'd walk every morning, get there early about seven o'clock, and she'd be sitting there looking at me like a dog. She'd be sitting there. I'd go into my hive, and then one morning I, I was late for breakfast, I took my breakfast with me, I broke it up into two boiled eggs, and she looked up, and I knew straight away she was sitting there when you saw the boiled egg when it's been broken open. She, and I knew I threw the egg out, and she ate it, and I threw another one out, she had that one, full of protein. So a female will not eat for two months. She won't drink, she will defend the nest. And I've seen her take on a male twice the size and beat them, saw them off. Because they backfill the tunnel, they backfill the tunnel, and then eight months elapse. That's a huge time for an egg to be incubated. It's massive. Now, we had to dig these tunnels out. We spent four days. Now, Rob, the producer here, the guy taking the picture, I said, he said to me, Mike, we can't spend any more time digging these tunnels. I said, well, we have to find these eggs. I said, this is the key to the whole sequence. I said, if we don't find the eggs, yes, so many promoted dragon films, all it is is fighting and eating. We need to have the whole process of these eggs hatching. Now, what happened was, I was down the hole, and Ron was down in front of me, and he said, Mike, I can feel something, and it smells bad. And he pulled out, and I had it, and I was pulling out the sand, and I, was, I had an old egg from the previous year, so it was a dead fetus. And then suddenly I felt something go behind my leg. I went around, I grabbed it, and I had a baby dragon in my hand, just like that. I could not believe it, and this dragon in my hand. And my, my head stood up. Well, it was too tight in this particular hole, it's not one we've been into. So what I did, I got all the eggs out. They're like big, about the size of a, bigger than a goose egg. And then we, I built another little um, egg chamber here. And I put corrugated iron over the roof top to create the darkness. And then we got the hatching. That's how I filmed it. So that has never been done before in the wild. It was it will probably you probably wouldn't get the permission now because they're so endangered. But they filmed them in San Diego Zoo, but they have a female that lays eggs, which you know, quite happily. But this, apart from the fact that we moved the eggs, that's for real. She's, that's just come out of the egg. So, and I had one in my hand, and I just had it. It was so exciting. It was like Game of Thrones. And out it came. And a, a, a reptile collector about a couple of years later said, so Mine was it. Do you know how much one of those would be worth to a collector? I said, Well, you know, we've released them all. Of course we did. And he said, You probably made the price. He said, You get £10,000, and just ask for it, you get it. And I said, well, we go do that. And, uh, we had 24 eggs, or 22 eggs. We had 16 live babies. Uh, the, other, there was, the rest were just been hatched. Going now on to my love is underwater. I shouldn't talk side, but I'm looking at sharks now. It's not the reason I want to show you sharks, but what I want to show you is how I go about shooting different shot sizes to make sequences. So here we have an oceanic white tip, very dangerous shark. Uh, I've never seen one, and I wanted to, and I was one on Christmas, and it was before Christmas, and I had some time off, 
I said to my wife, I said, look, I've got this chance to go down to the Red Sea to a reef called Elphinstone, and um, there's a chance, good chance of seeing uh, a shape like this. To me, it's a thousand pounds to go for a week, including the boat, everything found in flight. It was worth it. On the first night, I was coming back to the boat, first day, so I was, we got right on the evening. So the first day, I was coming back to the boat in the evening, it was really dark, and I just saw one go in front of me. I never took a photograph. I just thought, it's worth it. That was worth coming just to see that. But when you get them right, so this has got a little bit of fill. So I've used a little bit of, I don't like overusing strobes, but just to uh, <coughs> eliminate the um, pilot fish, but just to give it that like, portrait view. Again, you know, you get the same, same shark, different angle, get a head on view, slightly underneath it, gives it that strength. It's got its pectoral fins out. Ocean White is a renowned for big pectoral fins, so, you know, bearing in mind the other picture. Uh, go for that detail. Now, editors in the edit suite will always say some of the problems with underwater filming is when you get the camera in your hands, you're looking at a wide angle, you've got all the lovely blue water, light shafts coming through it. It's so easy never to pick that lens off. You could live for it for a week and you're shooting wide angles. What you need when you're taking, making a sequence is you need shots like that because they can use those as cutaways. And that is worth one dive to get one shot. And what I will do is I preset my focus, and I just stand there on the sea I'll be standing there and there'll be a shark feed going or something, and I wait for the moment for that to come into focus, and bang, 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 on the motor drive to get the one shot. And you can see all the detail of the uh, ample of... Lorenzi. Thank you very much, level of memory. These are the sensors. A shark can sense any vibration at miles away, but the big thing is, for one drop of blood in eight million, it will sense. So, a hugely effective person. I love sharks. So, just I really do respect them. Hammerheads, you'll see these in a sequence later, but skewing hammerheads, these aggregations form off sea mounts, the Cocos Islands, Galapagos, of course. Um, but again, these scholar hammerheads are highly endangered because of illegal fishing and shark fishing. That's what's going on. Um, but this is very close to going back to Charles Darwin, which we haven't been to actually, but going to Charles Darwin and the Beagle. The Beagle spent 34 days in the Galapagos Islands out of a five year trip. People think he was there for months, he wasn't. He was there for 34 days. And the last place they were at, they were heading out west across the Pacific. They came to Wolf, then to Hood. And at Hood, there was an arch, and they called it Darwin's Arch. That would be the last sighting you would have of the um, Galapagos. And this is right next to Darwin's Arch. But Charles Darwin wouldn't have seen this, of course. Again, shooting at night, these are Caribbean reef sharks. This is on a shipwreck. Just using half light. Sometimes I like to get in the water at just before dusk. If I'm doing a night dive, I won't go in at night. I'll go in when it's light. I like to let my eyes get accustomed. Like now, you go in the water now, so you get into the position, you know where that reef is or that rock, or whatever, and you know your orientation before you start the dive. If you go in when it's black, you're always searching. Go in when it's light. So half light pictures. Can be really, really dramatic. So that's what I've done there. So if your lighting is so critical with any filming, again, that's the same, same area. So I've got a boat up there above me. We're we'll putting two big H, you know, eight, um, HMI lights, 1.2 kilowatts, and you create moonlight. And moonlight gives you that lovely soft feeling. You're going to see a little bit about how I do it later. Marine conservation, what Robert was speaking about earlier, is a, a subject really important to my It really is so important to me. I've seen in my lifetime, you know, I started, I was starting to soar when I was six or seven years old. I've seen so much, 122 countries, I've dived in all those oceans, but I've seen huge, huge changes. And it's frightening. I was in the Maldives, um, not last year, but the year before last, so the first year of lockdown, first year of COVID. And it was the first trip I had done 
since for about 12 years. And in that time, there have been two coral bleachers. And the reefs that I recognise, these beautiful reefs in the Maldives, were no longer there. All the table coral was gone, just collapsed. The problem is, once you take the habitat out, the next storm, so the corals will bleach, they become skeletons, they can recover if, it's, if, it, if the temperature drops, um, goes back down again. But if it's continual heating, they can't recover. And then the um, skeleton can be left with the skeleton, so the first storm that comes through, they're smashed up. But the problem is, it's all the fish that live within the habitat of the aquatic table corals, they're no longer there. Again, sharks, this is probably shark, they've got a long line, caught. Things were too small, they just cut it off, they don't bother to throw it back in. Uh, Midway, again, breath holding, free diving, hugely important when you're a cameraman, do shooting underwater, because you need to have all these tools. On a dive job, what I'll have in the Galapagos, for example, you never quite know what you're going to see. So you, you'll have your rebreather all set up, you'll have your open circuit scuba set up, and I'll have my, my free diving fins, mask and snorkel, because you could be travelling between islands and then suddenly you see a humpback whale. And you can't even really breathe on, it's too, you, all your drills you have to go through to make sure everything's working. Scoops are going to be too slow, it frightens the shit the whale. So, mask and snorkel straight in the way you go. It's so quick. Again, with these spoon and dolphins in Midway, we finished filming. Bear in mind, filming is the priority, not taking seals. We packed everything up, we were heading back in slowly, and suddenly saw this pod come by. And Simon and Derek says, Mike, go for it. So I just got my mask and things on, picked up my silk scanner, I dropped down, and the main pod I missed, they were so by. They didn't come near any. But this tail of Charlie's, he suddenly came to me, turned, I just sat still in the bottom, to about 10, 10 meters, just sat on the bottom, and they just came towards me, and then they just split, and I got that one shot. Uh, so it was it. Now, where are sharks? This is in the um, Arabian Gulf. Um, this is an 18 meter male. Um, they had these huge aggregations because of the tuna spawning. And I worked on a film called Desert Seas. And there's a population in Saudi Arabian waters. And there's a population that aggregates in Qatari waters. This is in Qatari waters. And the reason I put this picture up is because what I like to do is sometimes is show you how dramatic using black and white can be when you've got an image. You, some images, I mean the sharks, they, they generally take it, shipwrecks take it, and whales definitely do, but how you can create a different mood. I don't have very many pictures hanging up in my house. I've got one of my favourites in the South of Dave Attenborough, but I've got this one in black and white, so I do like it. Again, conservation, why does this happen? People throw ropes over boats, just, it's just detritus, they throw over plastic. 80% of plastic, I'm going to talk about plastic in a minute, 80% of plastic comes from land, 20% comes from ships, rather than fishing boats. But ropes, this is probably off a fishing boat, I'm, I don't know. But the turtle is inquisitive, it just got tangled up, and it's basically stuck on itself. So, and I was coming along, I saw it, so I thought, what the hell's that? And um, I, I had a seals camera in the housing, and I tried to get some shots, I jumped in, and I, it just wasn't working, and I came out and tried off the dome, and I suddenly saw the boat in the background, and I thought, well, that's the shot, and it gives it a scale. So you have the distant boat, people, that of course, that's a green turtle there, and the opening shot that we saw it was a green turtle, same thing. Um, seahorses. Um, huge trade, traditional Chinese medicine, TCM, huge trade with seahorses. That seahorse to a fisherman in the Philippines is probably worth 50 cents. By the time it gets to Hong Kong, it's 25 US dollars. So the fisherman gets very little, he buys it, he gets, he'll get a sack of rice for it right now. But seahorses drive, they drive them out and they use it in medicine. Now, these guys. Did a film for the BBC, it was a QED called the Secret Life of Seahorses. And I followed these guys around, these hooker divers. So they're not diving on scuba, they're not diving on rebreathers, they're diving on a garden hose pipe, some of them. Just stuck in his mouth, no regulator, same guy with this chap. Homemade fins, homemade lights. 
And when I ask them, what fish are you looking for? They just said, we get anything. They don't care. We get anything. It doesn't matter what it is. It's food. And you can't, you know, people say, oh, they shouldn't be doing it. But they're supporting, they might have six children. They're supporting their families. And, you know, a lot of these guys who die early, they use dynamite. There's all sorts of things that go on. I see guys with hands missing. Um, and, you know, I see it, but you can't. They're doing it to support their family. Here I am in Papua in New Guinea, shooting uh, again, red holding. This is in the Black Water Lakes, the Jimmy's Lakes, with crocodiles. There are crocodiles in this lake. Um, but just doing spearfishing sequence, having spear catfish. And again, another population really under stress. Uh, it's one of those, you know, you travel in the world and you see lots of poverty and deprivation. And I certainly saw it here. People now lowish. Um, really were. Um, that's my favourite photograph. Now, Amorphophallus titanum, the titan arum, is a plant that flowers once every three day, three years. Now, I was asked to work on private pipe plants. And I was then based in Hong Kong, so I had to fly from Hong Kong to Jakarta to meet up. They said, Michael, you're going to go and film today about tomorrow. So I've done lots of sequences, but without a presenter. So generally, we didn't, this is when everything was transitioning in the BBC, they were getting rid of staff cameramen, they were using freelancers. They, I knew mean, I was out in Hong Kong, that was my base. So I got a lot of the foreign, Far East assignments. And Dave Attenborough was in Australia, I was in Hong Kong, and the film crew, the rest of the crew were coming from London. So I flew into Jakarta, so I was the first one in. So I sat there, Dave Attenborough just got his night home. And um, I thought, you know, what does one say? Um, it's an honour to meet you, Sir David. Or it's an honour to meet you, Sir Attenborough. What am I going to say? So I waited and waited. Mr. Akai, the fixer, was with me, who had all gold teeth and smoked, chain smoked cigarettes. So I sat in this little cabin with him, thinking about David Attenborough arriving. And then he said, oh, Mr. He said Mr. Attenborough is coming, Mr. Attenborough is coming. But I could see him coming. And I walked down to the water and he was dressed just like this. He had six of these shirts about four of these pants, and he has the same uniform. He was walking towards me, and I went up to him and said, I put my hand out, I said, it's an honour to meet you today. And he said, no, 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 Michael. He said, the honour is mine. He said, I've watched so much of your work. And he said, I have none of that, please. And he said, it's lovely to be over here, and I'm really looking forward to working with you. And that's how he, he, he is, and that's what he's like, and he still is the same. I've worked with him many times. But we were looking for this plant, a morphophallus titanium. Now, I've never been filmed before in a while, so you can see Kew Gardens, it's in Edinburgh Zoological um, Botanic Gardens. Um, so, the side of the plant basically is like a big tree trunk, and then it will die back, and then this cycle happens, and then it will come out as a flower. When it blooms, that bloom will last for two days. That's what it will last for. Then it collapses and dies. Then the cycle starts again for three years. So, to find one in the forest is really quite difficult. So there's the plant. There you are, it's all its glory. It's already starting to deflate. You can just see the ripped edge here. So, this is my first sequence with it. I was so nervous. You'll see a few of this. The second is inside the plant, flower. lives here in the tropical rainforest of Sumatra. Many flowers once in a thousand days. And when the flower develops, it only lasts for three days. So many of the people have seen it. But there it is. Technically, it's a whole group of flowers clustering around this, but you can be justified for regarding it as one flower. And if you do that, well then, this is the biggest flower in the world. It's related to the dead horse arum, but it's nine feet tall and three feet across. It's a morphophallus titanum, a titan arum. The function of this great sight in the middle is to produce a smell. <coughs> and if you smell it, it smells very strongly of a bad fish. This plant can attract insects. We come along here and go down 
is the straight funnel so these small flowers can grow at the base. Until this film was taken, no one was sure what insects pollinated the Titan era. As we watched, we saw that without doubt, the job was done by tiny sweat bees. Like other errands, the male flowers form a band at the top. Below them, the female flowers with long yellow tipped stigmas. The bees seem to find some warm stigmas for they crawl all over them, distributing the pollen they brought with them. But why should the Titan Aaron produce the biggest bloom in the world to attract such tiny pollinators? To be effective, these bees must bring pollen from another bloom. But since a plant is rare and only flowers once in three years, the nearest may be miles away. It's not easy to spread perfume over such distances in the still humid air of the rainforest. Perhaps the best way to do so is to disperse it from the top of a towering spire, like smoke from a factory chimney. Um, in David's book, Life on Air, he writes about that whole sequence and his top five sequences, that's one of them. So I was so chuffed to be part of it, so there we are. Uh, going into now, we to talk about some portrait work in macro and how you work on the water. It's, um, you know, when you know a certain fish is in an area, these fish are about an inch long, this is a leaf fish. And they generally avoid eye contact, they don't like looking at you, they always look, look the other way, and they adopt the colour of the coral they normally sit on. So you can see the red flush there of the coral, but this is in like a coral rubble cave. I was in the Maldives on this particular trip, and I spent the last day, I set my little macro lens up, I just love doing it. Uh, but uh, there's a little family of them, I couldn't get the other ones, they were see the smaller, but that's sh shoulder leaf fish. Cut using colour, um, so important again, um, being ready to react to what's happening in the water. So always, it's like, in a way, it's like fishing or like shooting. You have to be a quick reaction. And I was swimming along, and I was looking down, and I heard the shout, and I looked up, and there was a school of painted characters swimming by, and I had the wrong lens on, it was a 100mm macro. But I fired off three or four shots, and I thought, oh, there's nothing, there, nothing's going to happen. But then when you get back and you start looking, you oh, actually, I can do something with that. And you could bring out some of the blues, and it came out really well. So I never give up on trying to go through your, what inches you've got. Be very, very careful with anything. Now, here's a little sequence filmed for a series called, uh, for a program called Desert Seas, comparing the Arabian Gulf to the Red Sea. On the Arabian Peninsula, there's only one country that has those two seas, which is Saudi Arabia. So I spent 18 months working in Saudi, which is not the easiest of countries to work in, I can tell you. But uh, once you go offshore, it's fine. This is, this is shot in the Red Sea. Along these sea limits, gangsters drown. Blue-finned tripani are predatory hunters cruising the hood. The wolves of the Red Sea Reef tripanis are hunting through a nursery school of juvenile fusiliers. for anything that strays too far for falling scraps. Two meter wire corals reach further than most, and an enterprising little shrimp has made its home out on the limb. He survives by collecting passing horses. His frontier post puts him into a shoal of sleek unicorn fish.
That's a very prime sequence about using the trevally to take you into the next sequence with the wire pole. So you see the trevally sort of away, then you, I do the POV, you see the, the wire coil, and then you catch, you see the shrimp. Now I know that shrimp, so I've learned about it, these commensal sort of uh, relationships between certain um, corals and fish, and the shrimp uh, will actually live on, you might have 40 wire corals, and you'll find one shrimp. So they take a lot of looking, but when you find one, it will always be on that coral. So I found this wire coral shrimp, and I knew I had to film him to link him with the unicorn fish and the trevallis, because that makes the sequence slow. So I had a predation, then we come into the trevallis walking, swimming on the reef, and the wire, so I couldn't film the macro underwater because I was on the wall. If I was taking these still, yes, you can do a still, it's easy, but you can't take a video shot. So, I managed to get that mid shot. I found one other coral and I got the tripod up and I did that mid shot. So it was really going down, but it wasn't good enough for me to do the really macro work. I had to put on a, um, a doubler and a 100mm macro and get right next to it. So, what I did is I went back to my prime specimen. I got the shrimp up to the end of the wire coral, which is about three metres. I then had some white cutters. I cut the wire, I cut the wire. I put the little sample in a plastic bag, already on the deck, I built an aquarium on the boat, with a blue background, had a clam and a pump to get water circulating, come straight on the boat, suit off, dry off, took a spare camera, everything was lined up, shrimp goes in, pump starts working, shrimp starts feeding, do the shot, Get enough shots, put it back in the plastic bag, take it back to the coral, because we've marked the coral, you put the shrimp back in the coral, and then you take a broken piece and you find a little wedge for it along the reef, you ram it in there, and then we put some um, stones in to keep it there, and then that will grow into your wire coral. So that's that's how that sequence was done. But that's what you have to think about about doing so there's no set script to sort of do this on. So here we go. I'm now going to go into uh, an artist film I follow, and just people say, Oh, that's you know, the best country to go to in the world. You know, where's the best place to go down? And I said, Well, it's an impossible question. There's so many beautiful countries in the world, but I actually think Britain is so lucky in this country. There's so much to see in this country. And there's an artist I follow a lot who loves Dorset, Nicholas E. Hutchinson. And he, I think someone one day said, Nicholas, I really think, it was years ago, I said, I really think you should make a film about you. And he said, well, sort of, he said, I said, it's not for now, it's not for 10 years. He said, do you mean when I'm dead? I said, well, yeah, it might be, but it's following you. It's not a film about some paintings, it's a film about you and what makes you tick. So I shot this, little, so it's a 22 minute film, and it costs nothing to make it in my own time. He paid for a professional soundtrack, which is going to come on. I believe. Five minutes. Sometimes you have a very, very soft light, like we mentioned, a blue light will be like increasingly. Um, and this has no sharp sunlight at all. And it's a flat light, but because it's a flat light, you get more of an, an intense blue.
Well, what I'm always trying to do is get a feeling of what it's really like to be in a certain place at a certain time and to get the atmosphere of that place and the essence of it. And sometimes in the winter you might have something rather dark and gloomy, um, but it's rather poetic in a fun sort of way. And, and some of my winter paintings, of course I'm trying to get a sense of the coldness and also I sometimes put a bird in and it's a sense of vulnerability of a little bird in the landscape. Seasons change, the rich colours of sunlight unfold. Nicholas paints in a way that inverts you in the scene. It's as if you become part of this land. In the summer, I might have been painting that bit, but probably be trying to get a feeling what it's like, the heat, and um, uh, the sun on top of a hill, or whatever it is. Uh, that attracts me in the particular place I'm trying to paint. But essentially, I'm trying to get the atmosphere, so I'll put various elements into the paint that I can see around me and things I can hear. So it might be, I'll uh, see some wildflowers or something. And they may not be immediately in front of me, but I'll take them from one part of the composition and put them into the painting. But also birds and butterflies, and I'm trying to gather all the elements together to get a feeling of this particular place. And so that's really what I'm trying to do when I'm doing painting. And living in the Dorset countryside, which has remained virtually unchanged for hundreds of years, gives him a deep understanding of the hidden secrets of this place. The rugged beauty of the Jurassic coastline has featured in many of Nicholas' exhibitions. These paintings reflect far-reaching horizons, the ever-changing light, his passion for the sea, and the part of Britain he so cherishes. So there we go. So something I really wanted to make, and um, you know, he was thrilled with it at the end of it, and obviously uh, we showed it. We showed the Dutch Art Gallery, and they had, I think they sold 200 tickets, and they had 50 people at the door who were trying to get in because you see it, they didn't have to go to the second night. So that went down quite well. So here we go. Again, um, there's another film about to come up. I hope it's going to play. It's a, during COVID, very in my life, set this up for film students on what you can do with uh, special effects as you've got no money to do things. You know, you'd be working on a shoestring budget. Uh, and that's what I love about film. You know, sometimes I'm working on a planet dinosaur where they just throw everything in, in terms of money. And a huge amount of money going into making it. And there's other things I work on where you have to think about doing yourself. So this film is about a, a sculpture. It's about a two minute sec sequence. I hope it's going to play. If it doesn't, we'll just sit through. from my college course. 
I've, I've been making mantles for probably 10 years before I realised that they were actually, um, the reason I was so sort of obsessed with them was because they, they, they were sort of telling a story, um, a personal story about my dad. And as most people know, the story of the mantle is very, this kind of sort of tragedy and the mantle is supposed to be uh, this sort of monstrous creature that's sort of very isolated and lonely in, in this labyrinth. And basically, he's born, you know, he's a victim because he didn't ask to be sort of creative and he's, and he's sort of a shun and, and yeah, just put aside. And later, you know, I realised this connection with my father's story, which, you know, he, he had a very brutal upbringing. He was, he grew up in, in North London, very poor to, to um, sort of quite brutal existence as well, so in some ways his father was, was a slaughterman, was an alcoholic, was violent, um, he had uh, five brothers and you know they were all sort of beaten regularly, you know, it was, it was horrible growing up, no education, you know, he um, was expelled from school and, and he was quite a complicated character, he was, he suffered from depression in his later years, so hence our childhood was, was quite sort of colourful and um, difficult, but also he, you know, he, he Sorry, this goes as well. I do apologise about this. I'm just thinking through it a second. We're at already nine o'clock. This is another film we did because of COVID. I started start the portrait because I forget. I forget how nearly every time. Well, not every time. And so I have my tools, and I have my canvas, and I have somebody in front of me. And then I mark the top of the head, bottom of the chin, 10 centimetres. I like 10 centimetres. And then I'll just begin. Portraiture, landscape, still like it. It's, it's kind of a way of um, galleries and editors defining things so that they can be um, told to the public. But from the point of view of the maker, I mean, you're using the same equipment. Whether you're looking at a block of cheese or whether you're looking at somebody's face, it's, you're just looking. It's, it's not that different. You know, to look into anybody's face, you know, to look somebody in the eyes. I remember from young, it's, 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 it's unnerving. What happens? There's electricity, there's something that awareness. We, we've spoken about this before. And so, how do you? How do you get past that? You face it, you face it down. And then it stops being so overwhelming. Good. Right, getting down low, getting on the height of your subject. I was working on a film in the Central Islands, and there was a land crab that lives on a volcano, two volcanoes away to get down to a particular beach to spawn. It's quite incredible. But I, don't really, I, I never realised these crabs are really long lived. Um, but I, when I saw it spawning, I filmed it in the middle of the evening, there was some of them coming down. I got myself to that. And this, I got in the surf, I was lying in the surf, waiting for that moment. So, um, but it's, you've got to get on their level, you've got to freeze the action, and that will make, that's what makes the picture. Again, here with um, being on the water with an albatross, this is a juvenile, well, this is on Midway Island where we fledged, and this one was one of the lucky ones who made it, one in four don't, various reasons, a lot of it now is plastic, of course, plastic ingestion, which you'll see in a second, but I popped up, I was just snorkeling, and I suddenly took this boat rest, I swam over to it, got the camera up, got the drips off, um, and got the low level shot in the water. And it gives you a perspective of what that bird's having to put up with. He's, you know, he's going to live 60 or 70 years out of bird, but he's got to get take off from that water um, and get on. We go into plastic now. I worked on Tuvalu for a film called Plastic in Plastic Ocean, and seeing how these um, houses where people live. Up until the 60s, they didn't have plastic, they didn't have white goods, but of course, it's all imported now, and the island is being swallowed by its own rubbish. It is quite incredible. I saw that. I sat to the doll was facing down into water, but I just turned it up like that to make the shot, and they used that as a cover of the film. 
Again, this is what's happening on the reef. This is a plastic bottle, and you can see what's happening. It's being enveloped by coral. Um, this is down in Indonesia, a really remote atoll. Um, you've got mushroom corals there, fire coral, um, this is fire, fire coral. Uh, but this bottle is slowly being enveloped by this paralysis. So if a thousand years time, or ten thousand years time, we're still here, and somebody puts a core sample down and drill, they're going to drill into through coral and then drill into plastic. That's what we're leaving behind for our legacy, which is dreadful. Um, but it gets worse. I took a little bit of the feather and I got one of the guys behind me and I said, just 
drop, I drop the feather, just blow it through the frame. So you just get the movement of the feather going through. That's one bit of action that we cheated. Lighting Jennifer and the guy in the cabin, I looked at it, I, sh I thought I need an establisher, but I want to, she's a very attractive woman, so I wanted to make her look good. It's like sort of in this scene, but it looks, the scene is so horrible. And I lit her from inside the room and I shot it from outside, looking in, using a long lens to compress everything. There's various ways of doing it. So, and that's what they came up with. But the film has done the circuits, it's done the sort of people's. Now, as I see your program, the way here on 13 more to bit of a system to hold in about PPE. Now, they reckon that 20% of the plastic in the ocean has PPE, from rubber gloves, face masks, they're you know, all to protect us, but we're again damaging the environment. Um, using, I talked to you a little bit earlier about the um, humpback whale. I had to design a rig for dropping into 3,000 meters. So this is what I made this at home. I love making models. And so uh, this is to this dive on you did 3,000 meters, that's for sure. But to give an idea of how we were going to build a rig to support a whale and all the cameras, the remote cameras. Well, we did build a rig, but it wasn't quite like that. But um, I put that in there just to have for ideas. This is another thing I've done. I live on a marsh. On the, you can see the border fence here. This is China on that side, and this is Hong Kong. And I lived in a little hut just down there for six months, and they called me the wild man of Hong Kong. So I mean, this is a foreigner living out on the marsh, and I have one of my mate Julie was with me, and we lived in this little hut. And we get these visitors come out and say, well, can we come and meet the, the resident cameraman? So I said, but I built this pelican, it's a Dalmatian pelican, Pelicanus Christmas, Latin name, and sadly, they are no longer going to the Mike Bell Marshes, which is a Ramsar site. Weather changes, but also shooting, war is a terrible thing. If somebody's got a gun, they see a big bird flying overhead, what they do, they just go and fire off. So Dalmatian pelicans are really endangered. Um, it comes from the greatest Yugoslavia, so I'm not quite sure where about it, but it does come from Yugoslavia. So I built this model, so I would get inside it, I put my head up inside, I'd float down with a, with a pelican on my head, with a camera wrapped in cling film, a little point and shoot camera, 16 millimeter, and I swam out into the little deep bay to get as close as I could to the pelicans that were out there. But I got within about 200 yards, maybe 150 yards, and I think maybe the white colour wasn't quite right. Uh, but I did get some shots. Uh, but you've got to try these things. Now here we are on Walking with Beasts. Some of you might remember this. This model here, 20,000 pound model. Use it for a day and it's, it's written off. But the model was incredible. This is in the Florida Keys doing a seagrass sequence. There's the model on the water. You see how life like it looks. What I did, I adapted it. We put some hoses down up to the nose so I could get the operator, this is the guy that builds, built it as well, and he could blow down the nose and get some bubbles coming out just to give it a bit of action. So, radio control guys. By contrast, the water isn't usually dangerous for the mere theory. They spend most of their day here. Although they are shaped by those that look a bit like pigs, mere theory are related to neither. Look closely, though, the mere theory's nose betrays its true family connection. The nostrils and lip have joined together to become one dexterous muscular unit, which helps them forage for food. This is in fact a type of trunk. These benign herbivores are early relatives of the elephant. You can see how CGI has moved on so much, that's been 20 years ago. So then it's acceptable now, you see how it's aged and dated. But that's what we want to say. Ship, one of my big passions is shipwrecks. This is in Southern Channel. This is a wreck of the Invincible. We were excavating the ship. Um, 1758 shipwrecks. This is 
we're about six meters, sorry, we're about two meters under the sand here. So we've dug out and we've airlifted out the stern um, just to reveal the ship itself, which is quite incredible. Um, and again, using lighting, what I've done here is um, always think about the shot, you know, if you're doing something, I've put a light, I've buried a light in the sand, I'm filming that, so I can get a reflection on the face plate. So I've buried the light there, you don't really see it, it gives it a bit of room lighting on the, this is a, um, a port bottle, um, they're known as hammer bottles, sorry, mount bottles, um, but beautifully intact, covered in a very grey, uh, remarkably survived, they found quite a few of these. But so I got the diver to lean over, and I actually got underneath the barge, because we have a barge above us, so I, I wanted some shadow, I didn't want real daylight, so just make it a bit more gloomy, and that's how, how I got the shot. And I think now we end on the last sequence, from the, I think this is the Galapagos, I hope it is. <laughs> Which 
is still jams actually. I have three GoPros on the top um, with wide angle wet lenses. That gives me a full 180 degree view. So when I'm going across the wreck, you'll get a projection on the screen across three screens. And that will give anybody in that theatre the ability to look to their left, to look to their right, or look directly ahead and see the wreck uh, unfold. Underneath is another lens there, it's a tighter lens, and I'm monitoring everything on the top. It's quite a, it's a small rig, but it's doing the job brilliantly. That's my log. The real purpose of this type of rig is to give a person who's not a non-diver a feeling of what it's like to be on the solar channel. You've got the suspension of sand, you've got the current, the strength, you'll get that feeling of watching this film on these three screens. The cow will see glass frame, um, crabs scuttling by across the timbers, but it will give a very good feeling of what it's like to be diving in a mid-1700s shipwreck. This is behind the scenes, which myself and my mate mine shot, just to be working and what's it like to be down there with these big animals. All the reads here, so no bubbles.
to some of our younger audience to um, go into marine conservation because there are some incredible places left out there, there really are. And actually, we're, we're, we're on one right now, Monday, where I was diving in this morning with Tara, wasn't it? We were with Tara, with all those seals around us, and Tara was wearing sort of sky blue fins, and there was one particular seal that just would not leave you alone, just kept on chewing your fins, so it was just going around, around, around. But no, no, it's really exciting, so um, I love coming out here. It really is worth getting in the water if you can. But uh, thank you. Right, well, we, we are going to have a few questions, I think. So, does anybody have <laughs> any particular questions they'd like to ask? Just a really quick one, sorry. <laughs> um, in, in some way, and sometimes can be potentially dangerous diving with perhaps the animals and rebreathers. Have you had any encounters that may be a little bit? I think the worst oh. encounter I've had is not with the shark, it's with a crocodile. Right. Um, that was in Botswana. Crocodiles can go from zero to biting you instantly. Whereas a shark generally will give a lot of notice about what's going to happen. And it's not, I'm not a shark expert, I'm not. I've dived with lots of sharks, but it's, it's just certain things. I think being in the Irish Sea where you have lots of sharks around you and you can't watch them all, and um, if you put your hand out quickly, you might get nipped. But um, I was with a, filming a tiger shark in, um, in South Africa, East Africa, Alawa Shoal, and it was a big female. Uh, she was about 12 foot long, and um, we had a big bait set in the water, so we, she'd come in to this bait, and I was watching her go round and round. She knew I was there, I was just hanging back, and then suddenly she was gone. And that's when you start thinking, where is she going to come back? Because the visibility wasn't brilliant. I was looking around, looking around, looking around. I was shooting in those days on film, my big film camera housing. And um, when I turned the camera over, you ran the camera, you could hear it very faintly. You hear this noise, this motion. And suddenly she came 45 degrees straight towards me. She came slow right down. She opened her mouth. She put the camera in her mouth and she just sensed it because they can't touch. They can't touch. And generally, a lot of the time, a, a shark will mouth you before it bites you. And so they mouth it to see what it is and then they might bite. It's sometimes they might, they might not, but generally, no. But in terms of danger at sea, the worst two cases I've ever been involved in in all my diving career, thank God it will never happen again, but the most frightening things were being lost at sea. When you come up and there is no dive boat, that is the worst ever. Because you're, I was one occasion I was seven miles offshore, and I was in a big sea, so every time I went down in a trough, I couldn't see anything, all I could see was water. And you come up again, and you, I could just see the boat out of the distance, miles away. And the guy that was with me had a spear gun, because we had sharks all around us, it was in South Africa. So we took the spear out, we tied it, so it was like 12 foot long, the whole thing. And I put my SMB on top and then we just had that up. And he just held it. And the guy, about an hour later, he picked us up. And that was worrying. That is it's really a long hour. Yeah. It's a long hour. It's a long hour. I don't like it. There was no way we were going to make it back to shore. But generally, you know, here, there's Tom Pop ways. We've got, they can be quite dangerous. <laughs> about that feeling. <laughs> I don't know, so what about you, Rob? Have you got any sort of funny encounters? Not, not really, actually. Um, in fact, in, in the Pitkin Islands, I tend to be uh, with my buddy and I. Uh, we fairly soon sort of invented a, a signal to have for sharks, which was just that. We knew that there was a shark somewhere around. Mm. She was extremely wary of sharks. I tended to want to get a good photograph of a shark. So what went by? I would sort of want to get quite closer. And she would be, oh, come on. And then much safer to be close in pairs so that she would then have to sort of keep with me, although she didn't really want to. She just preferred to pretend to be a rock and just say, so um, I was to blame there. But uh, otherwise, uh, not really, not really anything too drastic as that. But, um, do, do, can we move on to perhaps another question? Sorry. I've got a question um, with regards to the Komodo dragon sequence yeah. that you filmed. Um, that uh, thing that uh, uh, you did with the moving of the eggs and stuff like that, 
Yeah. Is that something that film crews would still do these days uh, with moving of eggs and nests and stuff like that? Well, it's a very good question. Probably not. But then was then and now is now. The other thing was we had a permit. So we had a biologist with us. So we had a permit to do this. And we and the danger was we were I was to get down to the chamber mm. is twelve foot underground under sa uh, compacted sand. So there was a great danger. We didn't have any pit props. The whole thing collapsing. So we, in effect, we took the eggs out. We had the eggs for about two days. Well, the chicks, oh, I'm sorry, the dragons, baby dragons, for about two days, and then they were released. So, and the dragon will spend the first three years in the tree canopy. It doesn't stay on the ground. They get in the trees because the the most dangerous thing for a baby dragon is another dragon. They'll eat them. So they have to go up in the tree, that's where they live for three years and they come, then they'll come down. So, um, no, I don't think we did anything wrong and it, it illustrated what we wanted. And that sequence in the film, when it was actually shown once for seven minutes, the hatching was they come out of the eggs. And actually I got nominated, I hate to blow my own trumpet but I am, I got nominated for the New York Film Festival Awards. So they flew me to New York with my wife and blow it up then, but I got the top of wall. So um, two days later I flew down. I could not believe it. So that was in New York, yeah, it was very exciting. Because and if we hadn't got the egg sequence, that wouldn't have happened. So, um, but it has never been done again. Not in the wild, anyway. Thanks very much. Thank you. Any others? Yes. Did you train with the students or did you learn? I had no qualifications, nothing. I was, I was a child that had been denied school by the time I was 15 because my father was in the Air Force. I joined the Army as a boy entrant, as a, as a technician, as an apprentice. I did three years, three months as an apprentice, which basically saved me. Uh, and then I worked on, I did an apprenticeship on helicopters. Uh, then I worked on helicopters for four years with the Marines. And then I came out. I then I got a job working in the Middle East for an American aviation company. And in that time, I made enough money to come back home. I was 29 years old. And I bought a flat in Bath. So I made a base myself. And then I took, I changed my whole direction. I wanted to go back underwater because I've been working in the Middle East. I used to go diving all the time. So I went on a commercial diving course. So I did my commercial diving course. I then went to the North Sea, West Africa, Arabian Gulf. And it was when I was in West Africa that I made my Super 8 film, because I used to make it my spare time. That was the film that got me going. And during my diving career, I made enough money, because then, back in the 80s, the biggest problem was the cost of the equipment. Because relatively, the film camera then when I bought my camera at an underwater housing in 1985, I spent £29,000. The flat below me in a grade one listed building in Bath was on the market for £28,000. Now you can get a top of this range camera for about twenty grand. You can get a top camera for £20,000. The housing will cost you another ten. that's thirty. So say forty with a lens, and you can see you'll never buy a flat for, for £40,000. So that's the difference what's happened. So the prices have come relatively down, and more and more people want to go into wildlife filmmaking. Um, it's, now, it's a lot easier because we're not shooting on film anymore, because the process of film shooting was so expensive. When we shot Walking with Dinosaurs, each one of the film was 400 foot. So a 400 foot load, sorry, 1,000 foot for a 35 mil camera. Uh, those rolls were like £300 for one roll, they would last four minutes. So if you can get an SD card now, 128 gig for £25 or whatever they are, so that's a huge difference. So the film processing was massive and the cameras were so much more complicated because they were mechanical, because they were, they had to, you know, the way the film were fed through them. So, so yes, the cameras have improved dramatically. I wouldn't go back on film. It was a great medium to work on. I loved it. 
And the thing was that it was discipline, because it gave you discipline about shooting. Now what happens is you might get a film crew go out to shoot a sequence on, say, mandarin fish at night, spawning. They might shoot 100 hours for a two-minute sequence. And so an editor's got to go through that, whereas when you're shooting on film, you just can't, you give them 10 rolls, or you know, 20 rolls if you're lucky to go and shoot it on, so that's the, that's the difference. So it's, it's changing my mind. But I'm, I'm, I'm dry as toast. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs>